Chapter 58, The Conversations. Thanks to Roz's truce, life in the nest was mostly harmonious. But when the animals went outside, it was business as usual. Sometimes a lodger wouldn't return. Sometimes a lodger would return in the belly of another lodger. As you can imagine, that made for some awkward moments. So when everyone was gathered around the fire, they tried to keep things pleasant by having conversations like these. I wonder what Bright Bill is doing right now. Chit Chat lay on her back and looked at the ceiling as she spoke. And where he is and who he's with and if he ever thinks about us back here on the island. I am sure he thinks about us. I think about him all the time. I like to imagine that the geese had a fun flight to the wintering grounds and now Bright Bill is floating on a lovely lake eating yummy food and making wonderful new friends but hopefully you're not too wonderful because I'd like to stay his best friend if possible. That is a nice thought, said Roz. But I worry that the flock might have gotten caught in this icy weather. I do not think they would handle it well. Oh, don't worry. I'm sure they're fine, said Chit Chat. Bright Bill is such a great flyer that I just know he'll keep the flock out of trouble. He's a great flyer, said Roz, but I still worry. Life is short, dig down the old groundhog was giving another one of her fireside speeches. I'll be lucky if I see the spring. I don't want your pity. I've had a good run, but I'll tell you what. If I could do it all over again, I'd spend more time helping others. All I've ever done is dig tunnels. Some of them were real beauties, too, but they're all hidden underground, where they're no good to anyone but me. And they weren't even good to me this winter. Now, the beavers, they have it all figured out. They built that beautiful dam, which created a lovely pond and made all of our lives better. That must feel mighty good. The beavers made our lives better in another way, said Fink. They taught Roz how to build. Ain't that the truth? Roz, you must have saved half the island with your lodges. And to think we used to call you a monster. I'll repay my debt to you if it's the last thing I do. Your friendship is payment enough, said Roz. Oh, please, your sweetness is going to make me sick. There must be something we can do. Your friendship is really enough. Friends help each other, and I will need all the help I can get. My mind is strong, but my body will not last forever. I want to survive as long as possible, and to do that, I will need the help of my friends. The animals listened quietly to Roz and thought of their own struggles to survive. Life in the wilderness was hard for everyone. There was no escaping that fact. But the robot had made their lives a little easier, and if ever they could, the animals would return the favor. I have seen 93 winters, far more than any of you. Crag the turtle spoke slowly, but everyone always listened to his words. And I can tell you that the winters have gotten colder, and the summers have gotten hotter, and the storms have gotten fiercer. I heard that the ocean has gotten higher, said Chit Chat, but I don't see how that could be true. I mean, where would all that extra water come from? You are right. The ocean is higher. My grandfather used to say that long ago, this island was not an island at all. It was a mountain surrounded by flatlands. And then the ground shook and the oceans grew and the land slowly flooded until the mountain became this island. Animals from far and wide were forced to come here to escape the floodwaters. In those early days, there were too many animals living in too small a space. The island did not have enough food to feed them all. But between fighting and disease and famine, a balance was finally reached, and we have kept the balance ever since. Chit Chat's eyes grew wide with concern. If the ocean keeps rising, the island will be swallowed up by the waves and I don't know how to swim. If the waves ever do swallow this island, it will not happen for a very long time, said Crag. But then we will all be long dead 
even me. Everything has a purpose. It was Swooper's turn to lecture the lodgers. The sun is meant to give light. Plants are meant to grow. We owls are meant to hunt. We mice are meant to hide. We raccoons are meant to scavenge. Roz, what are you meant to do? I do not believe I have a purpose. Ha! I respectfully disagree, said Swooper. Clearly, you are meant to build. I think Roz is meant to grow gardens. Roz is definitely meant to care for Bright Bill. Perhaps I am simply meant to help others. Chapter 59, The Spring Dripping water, flowing water, splashing water. Winter's blanket of snow and ice was finally beginning to melt. White was fading away to expose the grays and browns that had been hidden beneath. Little green buds were appearing all over. Crowds of bright flowers were rising up from the dirt. And soon the island would be bursting with rich scents and colors. At long last, it was spring. The lodgers returned to their own homes. The hibernators emerged from their secret places. Roz roamed across the island and checked in with the beavers and the bears and all the friends she'd missed. Then the robot went home to work in her garden. After the bitterest winter anyone could recall, life was slowly returning to normal. However, it was a quiet spring. There were fewer insects buzzing, fewer birds singing, fewer rodents rustling. Many creatures had frozen to death over the winter. And at the last, as the last of the snow melted away, the corpses were slowly revealed. The wilderness really can be ugly sometimes. But from that ugliness came beauty. You see, those poor dead creatures returned to the earth. Their bodies nourished the soil and they helped create the most dazzling spring bloom the island had ever known. Chapter 60, The Fish Help, help, he's got my tail. Paddler was splashing and screaming in the pond. Mr. and Mrs. Beaver were nowhere to be seen, so Roz picked up a fallen tree branch and stomped into the shallows. Grab on to this, she said as she reached out with the branch. Paddler grabbed it with his big teeth and the robot lifted him up out of the water, and there, hanging from the young beaver's tail, was Rockmouth, the grumpy old pike. In one quick moment, Roz pulled in the branch and gripped the fish with her two hands. Paddler flopped into the water where his parents suddenly appeared. What's wrong with you, Rockmouth? Mrs. Beaver dragged her son away. You've always been a nuisance, but this time you've gone too far. Do us all a favor, Roz, and toss him to the vultures. I cannot do that, said the robot, but I might be able to help. Roz placed Rockmouth in a deep puddle near the pond where he couldn't swim away. Then she waited for the fish to explain himself. Fish aren't very talkative, especially grumpy fish like Rockmouth. But eventually he opened up to the robot, and before long she was waving for the beavers to join them. Rockmouth used to live in the river, said Roz, as the beavers shuffled over. But you trapped him here when you built your dam. He has been angry about it ever since. That doesn't give him the right to attack my son. It most certainly does not. I'd be upset too. I'd hate to be kept away from my home. Mr. Rockmouth, you should have said something sooner. The fish looked up from the puddle with a frustrated expression that meant, I try, but no one was listening. Well, the situation had to be remedied. And you can guess who rose to the occasion. Roz was determined to get Rockmouth back to his home. After she explored the nearby waterways, it became clear that she would have to carry the pike through the forest and across the great meadow to the nearest bend in the river. I need a large container said Roz to the beavers. Something I can fill with water so Rockmouth can breathe while I carry him home. I could make it myself, but I thought you might like to help. It couldn't have been easy to overcome her anger with Rockmouth, but after Mrs. Beaver had a chance to cool off, she finally came around. I suppose we're partly to blame for this whole situation, she muttered. 
Then the beavers did the right thing, and together they carved out a wooden barrel for the fish. Here you go. Mrs. Beaver rolled the barrel over to the puddle where the robot and the fish were waiting. This should work nicely. Rockmouth, I hope you're happy back in the river. Rockmouth just flicked his tail in a way that meant, Will someone please take me home now? Roz filled the barrel with water and a grumpy fish, and then they were off. She carried Rockmouth through the forest and across the meadow until she was standing on the river bank. Welcome home, said the robot. Then she tipped the barrel and the fish plunked into the river. Rockmouth's face poked above the surface. He flashed a big toothy grin and then he quickly swam away. Chapter 61, The Robot Stories. The story of how Roz helped Rockmouth spread through the river and across the island and it was soon followed by other robot stories. There were stories of Roz growing gardens in a dry, barren place. There were stories of Roz nursing sick animals back to health. There were stories of Roz creating ropes and wheels and tools for helping her friends. But most of the new stories were about the robot's wildness. You see, Roz had noticed that the, wild, the wilder she acted, the more the animals liked her. And so she barked with the foxes and sang with the birds and hissed with the snakes. She romped with the weasels. She sunbathed with lizards. She leapt with deer. That spring was a very wild time for our robot. Chapter 62, The Return. It was a quiet afternoon on the pond, but the quiet was gradually being overtaken by sounds not heard around there for many months. The sounds grew louder and louder, and then a flock of geese appeared above the trees. Honk, honk, honk. Most flocks of geese move lazily through the sky and trail off in wobbly lines, but not this time. This flock was fast. It flew in a perfect V formation, and it was led by a small, graceful goose. The flock flew once around the pond before gliding down and gently splashing into the water. The geese gathered in a tight group in the middle of the pond. They floated there for a while, softly honking to one another. And then the leader broke away from the others. He swam straight toward the nest, waddled into the garden, and fluttered up to his mother's shoulder. Welcome home, son, said Roz. It's good to be back, Ma, said Brightbill. Chapter 63, The Journey. After months of separation, Roz and Brightbill, mother and son, were together again. And they had so much catching up to do. They went into the nest and the robot built a fire. Then the goose gazed into the flames and told the story of his winter. This is what he said. We spent the whole first day of our migration flying over the ocean. It seemed like the ocean would go on and on forever. But just when the flock was getting tired, Long Neck pointed to some tiny islands on the horizon. We flew down to one of the islands and ate dune grass and rested our wings. After a few days of hopping from island to island, we reached the mainland and continued over fields and forests, and then the snow began to fall. I'd never seen snow before, and at first I thought it was beautiful, but it just kept coming. The others explained that the snow was early, that we were never supposed to see it, but there it was, piling up around us as we tried to sleep at night. Long Neck worried that the weakest geese wouldn't survive, and he was right. We lost old Widefoot to that very first snowstorm. We tried to fly around the snowy weather, but we got completely lost, and the weather became even worse. Lakes and ponds and rivers began freezing over. We couldn't find food or water, so we ate snow, and that only made us colder. We had trouble cleaning ourselves, and our feathers became dirty and heavy. The flock was in bad shape, but Long Neck kept us moving. We are geese, he squawked, and geese keep going. One day we were struggling through a snow shower when we saw something called a farm. It had perfectly square fields and enormous buildings, and stomping her way through the farm was a robot. She looked just like you, Ma. Longneck sent me over to speak to the robot, but I couldn't understand anything she said. 
So I just followed her through the farm and around the corner, and then I saw something I never expected. Plants. Bright, colorful plants. I didn't understand how plants could live in such cold weather, but then I saw that they were actually inside a building. I learned later that the building was called a greenhouse, and it had clear walls made of something called glass. The robot pressed a button on the wall, and a door slid open, and warm air came rushing out. I hadn't felt warmth in so long that I just had to follow her inside. Ma, it was like summer in there. The air was warm and sweet and sticky, and there were rows and rows of different plants. The robot didn't pay any attention to me, so I wandered around the greenhouse, nibbling on leaves and drinking from puddles. Then I heard a scratchy voice behind me. If I were younger, I would have killed you by now. I spun around, and there was an old cat. She walked on stiff legs, and her fur was gray and clumpy. The cat's name was Snooks, and she didn't seem very nice. But then she saw the other geese out in the cold with their faces pressed against the glass, and she told me how to open the door. You can rest right here, said Snooks as the flock hurried in. But stay out of sight. The humans aren't as friendly as me. None of us knew what humans were, but we didn't care. We were just happy to be out of the cold. Loudwing was so happy that he cried. The flock drank and ate and bathed and slept and stayed out of the way. Snooks showed us where to leave our droppings so they wouldn't be noticed. And for a few days, the greenhouse was our home. Once or twice a day, the robot would go inside and return with a box or a bag. But most of the time, she stayed inside and quietly worked on the plants. There was a barn that I just had to explore. It was filled with animals and machines and piles of straw and two robots. One robot was fixing a broken door when I walked in. She was using a loud spinning tool called a saw. She pushed the saw through a long piece of wood and dust shot into the air. Everything was going smoothly until the saw suddenly lurched forward and sliced right through three of the robot's fingers. She was fine. A minute later, there was a thwip sound as she popped on a new hand. Then she right, went right back to using the saw again. The other robot worked with the animals. Chickens, sheep, pigs, and cows, they were all in cages. The chickens kept asking me how I'd gotten out of my cage. I was explaining that I'd never had a cage when I heard panicked squawks coming from the greenhouse. I ran back and found that a human had discovered the flock. We didn't know what he was saying, but he looked really angry. Longneck tried to defend us. He got in front and he spread his wings and he honked, but the human wasn't afraid. He pulled out a shiny stick and pointed it right at Longneck. Snooks hissed, <sighs> look out, he's got a rifle. Suddenly, a bright beam of light shot out from the rifle and Longneck slumped to the floor. He was dead, Ma. The flock was so scared. We fluttered around and honked and knocked over other plants. But the human kept moving toward us, pointing his rifle. So I pecked the button to open the door and we ran outside into the cold and flew away from there as fast as we could. Without long neck, the flock needed a new leader. Everyone wanted me to lead. I didn't know what to do, so I started by repeating Longneck's words. I squawked, we are geese and geese keep going. Then I took the point and the flock spread out behind me. The weather had us all turned around and nobody knew which way to go, so I just led us straight south. We saw more robots and humans and buildings, but we didn't stop. We knew we were way off course when we saw the ocean again but at least it was a little warmer by the water, so I decided to follow the coastline for a while. There were more buildings by the coast. Most of them were on land, but some of them were on the ocean. The ocean buildings were dirty and crumbly and leaning in different directions. There weren't any humans or robots in those buildings, only sea creatures. We saw ships on the water, we saw ships on the land, we even saw ships in the air. 
They buzzed through the sky like giant dragonflies. And then we reached a place called a city where thousands of buildings and robots and humans and ships were all close together. When we stopped to rest on a rooftop, we met a friendly pigeon named Greybeak. She'd grown up there, so she knew everything about the city. She flew us over towers and under bridges and kept us away from all the buzzing airships. And everywhere we went, there were robots. Some of the city robots were just like you, Ma, but others crawled on six legs or rolled on wheels or slid up and down the sides of buildings. Some robots were really small and some were really big. They moved things and cleaned things and built things and did every kind of job you can think of. Graybeak brought us down to a ledge on the side of a building and told us to look through the windows. Inside was a family of humans and they had a Roz robot. When we looked into other buildings, we saw other humans with other robots. Every human seemed to have a robot. I told Graybeak about you, Ma, and she wanted to show us one last place. We flew out to the edge of the city to a really big building called a factory. Graybeak brought us to the roof windows and we looked down into the factory and saw machines building sparkling heads and torsos and limbs. The factory was building robots. A machine held up a robot torso and put two legs under it and they snapped into place. It put feet under the legs and they snapped into place. It snapped arms into the shoulders and snapped hands into the arms. A head was snapped onto the top and the robot was finished. Ma, the robot looked just like you. I think that factory is where you were built. I wanted to watch more robots being built, but it started snowing again, so we said goodbye to Graybeak and continued flying south. We saw fewer robots and humans and buildings and ships. The air became warmer and the snow disappeared. We started seeing other flocks of geese in the sky, so we followed them to the middle of a wide grassy field where there was a lake and hundreds of other geese. We had finally reached the wintering grounds. After we'd all been, after all we'd been through together, our flock had become very close. We kept to ourselves, eating and resting and remembering the geese we'd lost. But after a few weeks, we began to mingle with the other flocks. We met geese from all over the world, and they told us about their homes and their migrations and their troubles with the winter weather. Every flock had lost geese on the way there. A few flocks didn't make it at all. Before we knew it, the early spring flowers were poking up and it was time to fly home. We followed the usual migration route north. We flew over fields and forests and hills, but we didn't see any signs of humans or robots. And that was fine with us. Eventually, we reached the ocean and then our island and then our pond. And then I saw you. Chapter 64, The Special Robot. After Brightbill told the story of his winter, he and his mother sat in silence and they thought. They thought about poor Longneck and the human who had killed him. They thought about farms and cities and factories. They thought about Roz and where she truly belonged. Then, after a while, Roz told Brightbill her own winter story. She spoke of her long, dark hibernation and of how she had awoken to find the nest caved in all around her. She spoke of blizzards and frozen animals. She spoke of the many lodges she had built and the one that caught fire, but mostly she spoke of all the new friendships she had forged. I used to think that you were the only animal who would ever care about me, she said to her son. I worried that without you around, I would be alone again. But I was not alone. In fact, I made new friends all on my own. I think the other animals might actually like me. Of course they like you, Ma, squawked the goose. You're the most likable robot I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot. It was true. Bright Bill had seen hundreds of different robots that winter, and none of them were anything like Roz. None of them had learned how to speak with animals or had saved an island from the cold or had adopted a gosling. As he sat there watching the robot's animal gestures and listening to her animal sounds, Brightbill realized just how special his mother really was. 
Chapter 65, The Invitation Roz was the first to arrive at the next dawn truce. She had an important announcement to make. The robot patiently waited in the great meadow as the sky slowly brightened and the animals slowly gathered. And once everyone was milling around and chatting, Roz began speaking in her perkiest voice. Pardon the interruption. If I could please have a moment of your time. The crowd settled down and listened to the robot friend. We made it through a terrible winter. A new generation of youngsters is arriving, and my son, Bright Bill, has just returned to the island with his flock. I think we can all agree that there is much to celebrate. So in addition to the dawn truce this morning, I would like us to have another truce this evening. We can call it the evening truce, or better yet, the party truce. The crowd began chatting with excitement. I have planned a celebration, and you are all invited. I will take care of everything. Just please meet me back here at dusk. Oh, and I have a little surprise. Actually, it is not little. It is quite large. The point is, I have a planned, I have planned a celebration, and I hope to see you all there. Sounds great, Roz, but I'm afraid there's one problem with your plan. Mr. Beaver blinked his beady eyes. The moon won't be out this evening, so it'll be too dark for some of us to see. You are half correct, said Roz. Tonight will be moonless, but it will not be dark, I promise. Now, if you will excuse me, I must prepare for our party. I will see everyone back here at dusk. Goodbye. Chapter 66, The Celebration Dawn turned to day, day turned to dusk, and just as Roz had asked, animals were gathering again in the great meadow. Word had spread across the island that the robot was throwing a party, and everyone wanted to see what the fuss was about. The fuss seemed to be about a giant stack of wood. Roz had spent the day collecting logs and branches and stacking them in a perfect massive tower. The animals crowded around it, trying to imagine its purpose. And then they saw a golden light flickering in the distance. Roz emerged from the dark forest. In her hand was a flaming stick, which she held up like a torch. She was camouflaged in thick mud and clusters of wildflowers, but her camouflage wasn't for hiding. It was her party dress. The animals watched as the robot glided across the meadows, surrounded by a warm glow. Thank you all for being here, she said as she joined the crowd. One year ago, I awoke on the shore of this island. I was just a machine. I functioned. But you, my friends and family, you have taught me how to live. And so, I thank you. No, thank you, shouted a voice. You have also taught me to be wild, said the robot. So let us celebrate life and wildness together. At those words, Roz heaved her torch high into the air. It soared up, 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 and landed at the very top of the wooden tower. A ball of fire burst toward the night sky, and suddenly the meadow was bathed in firelight. Hundreds of shining eyes watched as bright flames crept down the sides of the tower and embers floated away on the breeze. The animals stepped toward the bonfire, eager to feel its warmth, and then stepped back afraid of feeling too much, and soon everyone was moving. The deer started leaping, the foxes started trotting, the snakes slithered, and the insects buzzed, and the fish jumped up from the river. Bright Bill led all the birds into the air, where they wheeled around the bonfire like a tornado of feathers. Roz sprang into the wild dance, her shaggy dress shaking and swooshing with each movement. It was a wild party, and it took our robot to make it happen. Roz and the animals partied all night long. They were so busy singing and laughing and dancing that they didn't see the cargo ship as it sliced past the island. But the ship saw them. It saw the towering bonfire. It saw the robot. And then it quietly continued through the darkness. Chapter 67, The Sunrise By dawn, 
The bonfire had dwindled into a smoldering hill of ash. Everyone else had gone home, and only Roz and Brightbill remained in the meadow. They lay in the grass together, watching as the soft light of morning crept up from the horizon. And then Roz said, Let us go for a walk. The robot and the goose hiked and flew up to their favorite spot on the grassy ridge. But then they kept going. They followed the ridge to the mountain and climbed all the way up to the craggy peak just in time to see the sunrise. I climbed up here once before, said Roz, as the sun's first rays warmed her body. I sat on this very rock, looked out at the island, and thought I would always be alone, but I was wrong. Are you happy, Ma? The robot thought for a moment. I am. I'm happy, too. Bright Bill closed his eyes and felt the wind and sun. There was a slight chill in the air that made him feel alive. Everything seemed just right. And then he heard a distant buzzing sound. The goose squinted to the south and saw a familiar shape in the sky. He turned to his mother and said, Ma, there's an airship flying this way. Chapter 68, The Ricos The airship approached from the south like some giant migratory bird. The ship was a sleek white triangle with a single dark window facing forward. Three identical robots stared out the window. The robots resembled Ra's, but they were bigger and bulkier and shinier. The word Rico was lightly etched into each of their torsos, followed by their individual unit number. They were Rico 1, Rico 2, and Rico 3. The Ricos flew in a low circle around the island. They saw a smoking hill of ash. They saw mysterious wooden domes. They saw four dead robots scattered across the shore. The airship hovered above the robot gravesite for a moment. Then it floated up over the island and lowered itself onto a small meadow at the foot of the mountain. The engines blasted air toward the ground bending trees and tearing grass. Then the landing gear sank into the soil, the engines powered down and all was quiet. A door hummed open and out stepped the Ricos. They took several long strides into the meadow and stopped. A shadowy figure was lurking in the, at the forest edge. The Ricos turned and faced it. They stood flushed together like a sparkling wall and then the shadowy figure began to move. Out from the trees walked some sort of two-legged creature. It was dusty and dirty. Butterflies flitted around the flowers that sprouted from its body. One of its feet was made of wood. And then the creature spoke. Hello, my name is Roz. Chapter 69, The Defective Robot Hello, Roz, I'm Unit 7134. We are the Ricos. We are here to retrieve all Rosam units. The cold, flat voice came from Rico One. He and his partners stood absolutely still and kept their glowing eyes locked on their target. There are four others, said Roz, but they are dead. We have already located the remains of the other units, said Rico One. We will collect them later. Now, come with us. The three Ricos motioned Roz to the airship, but she didn't move. Where have you come from? The Ricos turned and stared at Roz. Do not ask questions, said Rico One. Where will you take me? Do not ask questions. Why must I leave? Do not ask questions. I will not go anywhere until I get some answers. There was brief silence as Rico One computed his next move, and then he began to speak. One year ago, a cargo ship carrying 500 Rosam units was sunk by a hurricane. 495 units have been retrieved from the ocean floor. We have come here in search of the last five, and we have located them. Rosam Unit 7, 1, 3, 4, you are the property of Tech Lab Industries. We will return you to the factory where the makers will refurbish you and sell you to a work site. You will then live on that work site indefinitely. Now come with us. But I live here. 
That is incorrect. Rosam Unit 7134. Any further resistance will be proof of defectiveness and we will deactivate you. But Roz had more questions. Who are the makers? What is my purpose? Why can I not ask questions? This unit is defective, said Rico 1 to his partners. Commence deactivation. In perfect unison, the Rico stepped toward Roz. They raised their blocky hands, ready to restrain their target, ready to shut her down with the press of a button. But a loud squawk and a streak of feathers cut them off. Stay away from my mama! Bright Bill swooped into the meadow and started hopping around, ready to defend his mother. The Rico stopped and looked down at the goose. Of course, they didn't understand his words. They heard only meaningless squawks. And then they heard their target squawking back to him. Bright Bill, get out of here, said Roz in the language of the animals. These robots are dangerous. What do they want? They want to take me away. The Ricos stared at their target, target, trying to understand why she was exchanging noises with a goose. And then new noises began rising up. Rustlings and shrieks echoed from the forest. Animals were gathering. Their wild voices called out to one another. Ross needs our help. Those robots want to take her away. We have to do something. The uproar in the forest grew louder and louder. The Ricos peered past Roz toward the mysterious noises, but only saw foliage. Suddenly, shadows swept across the meadow, and Brightbill's flock dove onto the Ricos. The geese furiously flapped and pecked and wrapped their wings around their robot faces, clinging to the Ricos like feathery masks, distracting them, blinding them. Brightbill turned to his mother. Run! Run! 